In August 2021, the first crossing of the Aral Coombe was completed successfully by Rosie's dancer in Palm Oliver. It's very exciting. <laughs> this pair fought through dust storms, equipment breakage, punctures, thirst, illness, and soaring temperatures of over 50 degrees Celsius. For those of you in the U.S., that's 122 degrees Fahrenheit. They did all that to complete this expedition in just 17 days. I'm going to say this is nothing short of a remarkable achievement. So before we get begin, the first thing we have to say is congratulations, Rosie. Congratulations on making this trek. And uh, thank you so much because it's truly really inspiring to see what you achieved on this expedition um, as the first crossing and with so much of it that you did on your own as well. Uh, you made great time in very unforgiving conditions. And I think we would all like to know, how did you find the experience overall? Oh, well, thank you. It's lovely to come back to an introduction like that. Thank you very much. But I'd also like to reflect it back a little bit because um, Pom and I really only got into our starting boxes anyway, thanks to your Air Swift team and the amazing way that every single one of your team played their part in getting everything to work in some really fiendishly difficult uh, logistics. Very complex it was, but there we were, we got into our starting boxes and um, how well I remember talking to you uh, before we started saying what we anticipated and uh, what we thought some of the experiences would be, et cetera. And um, well, <laughs> transpired of course, that there were some of them quite different to what I, I was talking about. Um, certainly, I think that both Pom and I found it much more grueling than we had anticipated. I think um, we actually fell foul of um, feeling that just because of our previous polar endeavors, that um, this was, wasn't going to be a picnic because we were once again new girls at the beginning of a learning curve going to this place that nobody had crossed. But we felt that, well, it's not going to be as um, dangerous, life-threateningly so, as perhaps our polar expeditions. Um, but we, we found that it could be and nearly was, actually. In a variety of ways, we, we found it incredibly testing. And it, it wasn't actually just the physical aspect. Um, it was mental. And it was emotional as well. We did both have a desert experience, but we didn't have so much experience in hauling heavy carts over uh, a much more varied uh, desert scape than we had anticipated. We also had never dealt with the um, heat to that degree before. We hadn't dealt with thirst to that degree before. Um, and also, um, it was a very modern expedition in the context of the other uh, rakes under the, the, the scrub that came up and hit us in the face, which were modern challenges like the atmosphere being so toxic and the impact of, of the global climate changing and the devastation which we were going to experience close up firsthand at the coal face. It's kind of amazing to think about and to, to think about what you saw firsthand. And one of the main reasons for undertaking this expedition was in part a fact-finding mission and to see firsthand the effects of the draining of the RLC. Um, I think what you experienced is uh, is eye-opening and uh, it's it's I'm just captivated by it and would love to hear some brief insight on some of those issues that you witnessed firsthand. Um, we had planned specifically a, a route of some 600 kilometers. Um, I wanted it to be uh, as varied as possible to take in as, as much the diversity of it all as possible. So we, we began by crossing over the steps to, to to reach the original drained seabed. Now, crossing the steps meant uh, going steadily uphill through some very sharp 
scrub and very rough terrain, which <laughs> had shredded our otherwise wonderful carts, which had, uh, you know, they had specially designed for desert. They had special tyres, but even the tyres couldn't withstand these, these um, foundishly sharp thorns. So by the time we then descended down onto the uh, seabed, uh, the, <laughs> the wheels, the tyres had repairs on repairs. Um, but we, we struggled on with those for a while, and uh, we found that our whole route from the steps across the salt pans and the salt and the muddy patches was littered. Uh, with the tail of the impact of this draining of the sea because it was endless carcasses of horses and camels and cattle. And um, the heart-rending thing was that in most instances, um, we could see that they were all following their traditional paths to water. And we followed some of those paths and we got to the areas where you could see from all the hoof prints where they would all gather. Um, but there was no water. There was just salt pans and carcasses. So uh, it, was, it was very um, emotional. Um, there were also carcasses, if you wish to put it that way, of, of the old fishing vessels, which were stranded um, without any sea in sight, most of them at all, just sort of rusting away what was left because, of course, the communities, being desperate, had scavenged a lot of the um, metal. But it told the tale of um, how desperate it left all the local communities that had been relying on what was once a very bountiful sea and a very good livelihood. The Kazakhstan government is now taking, um, you know, steps to, to in regenerative efforts, you know, to, to try to, to help in, in all of this. Were you able to witness any of that, to see anything on a positive side of it coming back? Very much. And there's, the, there's evidence of it even before we started, because I wondered uh, uh, whether the uh, Kazakhstan government would actually be a, a little bit um, understandably wary about the sensitivity of the area, you know, us going across and saying that how, you know, shocking it was and all the rest. But I think they understood that we were there also um, with a positive purpose to see, you know, what measurements were being undertaken and were they working and was there a glimmer of hope. And uh, so they were very supportive from the the, the government uh, right across the board to the um, Kazakh ambassador in London, etc. And uh, we built into our route, uh, obviously, to go and see, uh, to cross the uh, Barsa Kelmis Nature Reserve, then to go on to the um, Cockerell Dam. It's, uh, it's a huge long dam and dike, which is some 13 miles long. I mean, thought we could do it in lunch hour, but <laughs> it was it was quite a long way. Um, but it was the first time actually we suddenly came into an area that felt different. It 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 had a much better energy, there was colour, um and there was busyness with people. And this is because the, the, the water levels have risen um north of the dam by some three, four meters, which means that the, the fish are returning. And you've got all sorts of um, salt tolerant species there now, like pike and perch and carp, um, which means that people are going back to their fishing pursuits, which also means in turn that all the communities, particularly the younger men who had been leaving because there was no, no way of making any money or a living, are actually coming back because um, fishing there is a very lucrative um, pastime and, uh, well, way of life. In fact, originally, um, the Aral Sea provided Russia with a sixth of its entire fish supply. So it showed how rich in fish it was. Um, but it also means that some of the flora and fauna are coming back to life because the delta and the wetlands are returning. And generally, that harsh 
concentrated salinity is lessening now. And the lake itself, i.e. the sea, the north side of uh, the original sea on the Kazakh, over the Kazakh border, was once about nearly 100 kilometers away from Aral itself, and now it's only 10 miles away. So um, everybody that I spoke to, including the um, people on the ground, importantly, um, were very positive about the dam. And the key thing here, I thought, was that it gave them hope. It, it meant it was worth working um, at all the other ideas and the projects and, and being positive. And in fact, they, uh, they being the government, are talking about uh, planning a second dam uh, within the Bay Area of Aral itself. The other thing that they're very uh, supportive of is the saxial tree plantations. Um, a saxial tree is, is very hardy and it can survive high salinity. And um, the Uzbeks in the southern side of what was the Aral Sea have planted massive amounts of uh, saxal trees. And it's been very successful because um, they hold back the process of desertification. I mean, one saxal tree can hold back 10 tons of sand. So, you know, they're pretty effective. And um, they also, they provide all sorts of other things, like they provide a certain sort of medicine. You can actually extract water from them if you know how to. <laughs> they provide fodder and cover for the livestock. And uh, they even provide a certain sort of dye for some of the local textiles. I think that it's, it's a good sign that the government are backing these projects up. And um, they're... Talking just before I had this call with you, I had a message that the ambassador had said that yes, the the, the new plan for uh, planting a million saxial trees in, uh, around the Aral Basin is is going ahead. So that's, oh, that's cool. fantastic news. Yes, great great news. Your partner on this expedition was Palm um, Oliver, yeah. and yeah, and Palm um, unfortunately had to leave the expedition due to illness. Um, and I'm truly hopeful and, and sending our great wishes to her that she's fully recovered by now. Yet what that meant was you were alone um, and walking for 10 days, you know, on your own at that time, which I can't imagine with the heat, everything you were, you know, pulling you know, alongside with you, how mentally tough you had to be to continue um, with, you know, all the changes that that needed to be made. So how did you go about staying positive? How did you persevere? How did you like really push through that incredibly difficult moment? I will forever remember the, 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 the hardest, um, the hardest moment of all of that. Uh, was actually uh, saying goodbye to Pom and I'll see you, you know, in a in you know a couple of days time or whatever it takes in a sort of British you know gung ho way. I mean, it it broke my heart because I I I realised how she must feel, but um, it had been terribly difficult um, to the point where I got very concerned for her because. Um, we had we were going through a stage where there was no way anyone could really reach us, and um, Pom could only manage an hour max, maybe half an hour sometimes before I had to <laughs> throw her under a tamarisk tree and and give her some shade and sponge her down, and because it was so hot and she was clearly not well, and I relayed her cart and I'd go off for you know half an hour and then come back and get her cart and then come back for her and so on. So uh, we did our best, but she was getting worse, not better. And so um, she had to be evacuated. And because she had to be evacuated and the state of the carts, our local Kaz anchor man came in with his driver to take um, POM and carts and leave me with a uh, rucksack and as much water as I could stagger with. And 
things often go totally haywire at the beginning of an expedition. We're only sort of the first third through whatever it was. We just got to adapt, modify and go on. And that we will do. We'll just do it very differently and, and you know, not according to the plan. You know, I can't resist the Eisenhower quote here about, you know, in preparing for battle, I've always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. <laughs> and this is exactly what happened. So, um, POM, carts, both uh, evacuated, all of them to come back, I'm happy to say. And um, I went on with... Uh, rucksack that was far too heavy in boots that didn't fit but that's another story um it's not <laughs> good <laughs> it's not good in temperatures that were actually above 50 degrees um wow. by then wow. and um the interesting thing about this was that it, it was never a question to me about continuing um, I knew that the momentum had to be kept up. Um, I had to stay hopeful that POM would rejoin and that I was propelled uh, by the conviction that the message that this expedition was taking with it was obviously, from what we had seen and experienced already, so important. I had to complete it and we had to get back to share our learnings with our sponsors and, and with the rest of the world, um, you know, as pedestrians, not as politicians or scientists, we were seeing it in a way that so many people are not able to see it. And um, that, that there was no question of ever giving up. So much admiration for your perseverance and just uh, grit to, yeah, push through this. And um, Rosie, I think you were going to have a lot of technology with you as well. So does that mean through this change, like what, what was the technology? Were you able to communicate or anything else to the outside world while you were doing this on your own? We had two systems communication. We had a uh, satellite telephone um, powering for which we most part relied upon solar power, but we also had a pair of mini in-reach trackers, which you can communicate on. And we were supposed to give one to uh, our anchor man and keep one, but I actually kept both and gave one to POM myself. And in the end, that proved to be invaluable when POM was ill and I was ferrying because I could make sure that um, she was all right all the time. I could make sure I could find her again. <laughs> <laughs> Etc. So occasionally uh, water supplies would be extremely low. And uh, I was sort of navigating an awful lot of compass and map. And I knew that if I ran out of water, that nobody would be able to get me or get to me. So that was quite uh intimidating sometimes well i can i can only imagine it and uh again i mean it's 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 quite the feat that uh you've accomplished here and i'm sure you're focusing on your full recuperation um, at this point are you feeling better at this point how are you feeling now that you've been oh, yes. back and you're I think wonderful because i i came back uh so underweight <laughs> uh i was just under six and a half stone so everywhere I went, people gave me cake and wine. So, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had my back, the skin on my back, which was all taken off, really was has healed, okay. um, and uh, my feet are fine now too. Probably don't want to wear regular shoes though for a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I can hide them in comfy winter boots now. I think <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of winter, you've always done polar expeditions before. So you were used to the freezing cold. You were used to a very different climate than the desert and having to hike through extreme hot, you know, conditions. Uh, what, are, what are you thinking about for your next expedition? Have you put thought into a, where are you going next or is it too soon to tell? Of course, I am already incubating, an, well, a couple of ideas, actually. Um, and I have to see which develops. So the, the, um, 
I cannot actually say in particular one because it is a very, <laughs> it's a sensitive area. So if I mention it now, I might blow the whole thing out of the water. Okay. But we have my absolute word that, um, and I've written it at the bottom of these notes here, <laughs> that I shall let you know first, well, second to my husband. Um, okay. okay, I'll take second. <laughs> what it is when I decide to make it known. Uh, it, it will be in extremis. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, we're going to go from one, one extreme to another and lessons along the way. And Rosie, we can't wait to uh, <laughs> be on that journey with you as well. I think today we've learned so much about the impact of our decisions um, as a community, as a government, as people overall. We've learned about hope and how good hope is and how that can bring communities back together and rebuild. And we've learned about determination that no matter what you're confronted with, I'm gonna think whenever I'm having a bad day now, 50 degrees Celsius and higher by myself out in the middle of a desert and your push to get through it and to make it happen. I mean, that is just so inspirational, Rosie. So to have the determination and the resiliency to continue on and to complete what you started with, all of those lessons, I think, are, are key lessons that we can all take, take away from this expedition and uh, really reflect on. So thank you so much for sharing this with us. Oh, thank you, Jeanette. Thank you all for all your support and for all your interest, too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, here's to the next one, Rosie. Thank you so much for sharing this one. Take care. Thank you. <laughs> you too. Bye.